You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. My guest today is Bob Kennard. Bob Kennard is a longtime farmer who lives in Northern California. He's been farming for over 30 years, and he's also the co-founder of the Green String Institute. On today's show, Bob will be speaking with us about his philosophy and method of farming called natural process agriculture. Welcome to Sustainable World Radio, Bob Kennard. I'm thrilled to have you here, Bob. I've heard you speak twice at the Heirloom Expo and have been to your house and did a video interview with you. And I really admire the way that you farm. And I'm wondering if we can start off, if you could just tell our listeners how long you've been farming. Oh, well, I grew up in the commercial nursery industry. And and, um, and then I went off to uh, a land grant college, didn't last there very long, and came back and started... uh, a retail nursery because that's how I knew how to make money and make a living, and that didn't last long. And I, in 1976, when I was 22, I uh, came up here to this farm I'm sitting at, old home farm we call it. It's about 25 acres of highly diversified mixed fruits and vegetables. It's basically a big home garden. We grow a little bit of absolutely everything from the from the culinary herb through all of the fruits and vegetables to at least several hundred different varieties during the course of the year. And um, Bob, how did the shift occur from, I think when you were working at the nursery, you were using more conventional methods of growing plants. How did the shift occur to your new, your not your new, but your way of farming now of your natural process agriculture? Well, you know, I did. I grew up uh, dumping DDT and chlordane and malathion, all the poisons of the 60s, liberally using them with no body protection ever. You know, there was never any concern or consideration for that. You know, you just breathed in the dust and shoveled the stuff out. And, and if I had any free time, I got away from the, the agricultural nursery fields and, and wandered up into the structure of nature and the surrounding hills. Like one of the projects they send me on is is to go out and spray the oak caterpillars that uh, would live on not just oak trees, but other stuff. And, and so we'd spray them and get drenched with malathion. And then I observed the same caterpillars up in the mountains and on oak trees. And, and you know, they were always on a on a shaded out lower branch or something that the tree didn't really need. And, and, and the, they'd swarm out, defoliate the branch. And a year or two later, I'd see the same branch and it had it died and it had fallen off the tree. And, and it seemed very natural. And, and we didn't spray, we didn't feed the trees of nature at all. They seemed to do very well. And so the first chance I had when I got out of the nursery industry, and I sold out very quickly and easily and cheaply in order to separate myself. But I still had enough money, and, and I taught at the junior college, plenty of money to uh, sustain myself. I didn't have any employees here in the garden for the first five years. I um, wanted to do everything myself and study the practices and at the same time study the structure of nature. And from that, I concluded that the importance of, of mineral nutrients by observing the digestive action of soil biology on on the rocks of the soil and, and the importance of that soil biology. And, and I set up a little lab and studied the, the, with the microscopy and developed my thesis on, on, on sustainable and natural process agriculture. And, and so I um, have my whole career, I've been working on developing process of growing 50% for people at the same time, growing 50% for soil organic matter to support that very, very important digestive soil system. Hmm. And when you talk about the soil digest, the the digestive system of the soil, can you explain that further? The plant, plants are carnivorous. There's every organism of the, of the soil that's very, very important, very important and highly diverse, all living in a 
if, if healthy in a civilized soil culture that, that keeps everybody happy and in balance, checks and balances, and, and um, you have the vegetarian organisms and the, and the carnivorous organisms, and they work in concert together, um, all critical. In, in, you know, if you have bad digestion, we call you sick. And um, the same with plants. Plants have bad digestion, and they don't get the mineral nutrients that they need, and um, they're unhappy, and then they get leaf bugs, top side bugs as well as root bugs and bugs on a plant means that they're sick and and so if you have good digestion and you have full spectrum mineral nutrients then that digestive system is is really working in addition if you have lots of carbon in the soil from from plants that you've allowed to grow and then been left in the soil as soil organic matter, steady state food supply, lots of carbon, good broad spectrum biology. Then you develop the free living nitrogen fixing microfloral population. And, and here on my gardens, especially this well-established older garden, um, we use an average of two pounds of nitrogen per acre, where typical to grow corn, we usually use 200 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre, and it's, it's toxic, and it, it poisons the soil and kills the biology and, and pollutes the water table and the waterways as well. So it's, all of our agricultural practices come from our history, and that history a long time ago was um, a, a small population in the state's planet, and now we live in a different economy of a big bigger population in a relatively smaller planet and we've gone systematically growing all for people and and nothing for nature and in the old days you would just take a piece out of nature and and exhaust it and then move on but uh today we we have big equipment and different technologies and and bigger population and that we just really need to learn how to live within the structure of nature so we um don't um repeat the mistakes of the past uh, changing um, uh, beautiful rainforest or near rainforest places like the, the Gobi and the Sahara and the Sonoran and the Baja California all used to be very fertile, beautiful places historically, and and we've made them into deserts, and we'll be making our our countries and lands into more deserts in the long run, and that's that's um, if we're going to continue as a as a balanced civilized culture, if we hope to get there someday at any rate, um, we need to take care of our foundation, which is that life in the soil. Mm-hmm. And so when you advocate farming 50% for people and 50% for nature or soil improvement, can you give us some specifics on that? What are some of the techniques that you use? There's, let's say, um, that you want to grow a, uh, a bunch of summer squashes, like zucchinis and all of that whole group um, in the summertime. So they're planted about, the rows are usually planted about five feet apart. And, and so we'll go, go into that piece of ground and there will have been a, a mature standing cover crop on it before and, and residues from other cropping systems. And that'll be mowed down and lightly cultivated. And, and then the summer squashes will be planted, each seed about 18 inches apart in a row, five feet apart. And then it'll, when it rains, it's irrigated or when it comes up, um, then we'll cultivate about a one foot strip, right? around that um, row of squashes, but allowing any other plant to grow there. But then an intervening three or half or four feet between the rows, the, all of the um, indigenous weeds, whatever happens to be established there, plus ones that planted, additionally, oftentimes, like buckwheat and clover, things like that in the summertime, they'll all be allowed to stand and the squashes will grow and the um, competition nature support plants will grow. And when the nature support plants get too big, then we'll mow them off. And so and then they'll they'll come right back again, but they've been suppressed a little bit instead of killing. It's much easier and better to suppress than kill and and manage. And, and, and then um, summer squash need to have a regular um, supply of water, so they need to be irrigated on a regular basis. And, and we can turn that water off, and because we have a nice mat, almost like a crude lawn, of roots holding and supporting the soil and, and the living and cut parts of the of the nature support crop between the rows uh, growing. Um, we can turn the water off and walk right out there and not compact the soil and get mud splashed onto our fruits so we don't have to wash the fruits and there's no bare soil, only that little strip that's right under the plant that's all covered up by the leaves of the zucchini plant. It works very well. And then when the squash crop is finally finished being harvested after about 90 days. The native nature support crop isn't being walked on very much anymore, and it's allowed to come and grow to maturity. 
and when it gets to be mature and dies of its own volition, then you have durable organic material in its stems and its roots, and and it makes its own seeds for the next cycle of, of cropping system, and and then it's ready for cycling back to another human side crop. So when I plant like this and cultivate like this, I don't necessarily achieve 100% theoretical gross yield, but I have very, very low inputs. On, um, in addition to that, the um, soil grows as people grow, and so I get about a 75% human food crop per cycle, and, and as well as a 75% nature support crop per cycle. And so instead of just 100%, I get 150%, 50% for people now, and 50% for nature and which is for people later as we grow soil when i first came to this um, farm it was a heavily eroded pedigree turkey ranch for 40 years 40,000 birds for 40 years it took its toll on the soil i'll tell you and hardly anything would grow here only the most tenacious of wheat and today um uh, everything can grow here and darn near pest what people call pest pest free very, we look at bugs as indicators of plant health, and so if you do have bugs, then that means that the plant's not healthy, and that means that there's an, genetics are good, so the only option is environmental influences, and so we have to correct those environmental influences, and, and there are only really four primary food groups that every living thing is made of, and compounds that come from the digestive system, very important, and the air and the minerals, the rocks, and the sunlight, and the, all the cosmic energies. It all works beautifully, and we have a trust in the natural process, and um, and it, it works. We talk about 100% being sustainable. That's not really sustainable. You need In every action, you have inefficiencies, and so we need more than 100% gross yield, um, and that's where we get it, 50% of it. 75% of theoretical yield in, for nature and 75% for people. And, and so I've grown soil here. We used to, When I first came here, we had less than 1% soil organic matter. And today we average 5 or 6, depending on where you look in the garden soils. That That's impressive. Well, and that's very important. All of that soil organic matter is, is atmospheric carbon that the plants have absorbed from the atmosphere and deposited in the soil. And you have high carbon and, and all of the good minerals and this broad, balanced food supply, um, long-lasting, longer than one-year half-life of digestion of, of a typical straw in material in, in the soil in a temperate climate. And so you have a steady-state food supply for the soil biology, and then you develop the free-living nitrogen-fixing organs that need that input. So it's really, it's more relationship-based than focusing on compartmentalizing the plants are separate from the soil, from the weeds, from the soil biology. They are not separate. It's all, it's all a one integrated, highly diversified system. Like I'm looking out at this one little field right now. It has um, uh, 200 peach trees on it and 200 lemon trees on it. When I first came here, there it's on a hillside, and there's a paved road that runs along the bottom edge of it, kind of, and there was a, a substantial ditch about two feet by two feet and three 12-inch culverts to carry water underneath the road, and it still wasn't big enough, and mud would wash up onto the road that needed to be cleaned to pave road. And today, even after three years of first breaking up compaction mechanically by chiseling and then growing um, cover crops on it in the winter so the roots held and supported the soil, it rains on that piece of ground, and there's no runoff, and the ditch has been filled in for 35 years now. And and the trees, the lemons and the peaches, are all grow beautifully with the with the water infiltrating instead of running off and the organic material, one unit of carbon will hold eight units of, of, of water. And that means that, that uh, and it's five, six percent on soil organic matter content will hold about 40 or 50,000 gallons of water um, in the top 18 inches of soil, which is um, significant. So I don't have to irrigate those trees. There's, there's, two crops there. There's the nature support crop on trees. It's very easy, but it comes up waist high in the, in the springtime. And then there's the tree canopy, which is a human crop, which is above that 18 inches. You know, there's nice small trees. So it's a, it's a integrated system where everybody is contributing. And, um, and my, well, this year we had so many peaches, we could barely keep ahead of harvesting of them. And the lemons, of course, are always in demand.
And Bob, when you talk about nature support crops, can you tell us an example of a few of those? Oh, sure. When gr growing a, um, a system, you want high diversity in your in all, all systems, but a nature support cover cropping kind of systems, you want to start with the very small, quick growing things like annual bluegrass and wild calendula and fillery, so many little indigenous or transplanted weed type species they might be known as. And they germinate at the slightest inclination of rain and con good conditions. And they hold and protect and nurse the higher level of life support plants. And in the winter time around here, we're just getting done using the, the oats, the wheat, the barley uh, as high protein grains um, uh, to come to maturity. And, and the mustards, mustards come up um, soon thereafter, the small weeds do. And, and then they hold and protect the soil and make keep it warm and protected from erosion and splashing. And then up come the, the legumes like like the clovers and the peas and the vetches. And, and then as it goes through to April and May, the mustards and all the little weeds have died off and been shaded out. And, and the vetch and the peas use the mustard plants that have now are just like skeleton, dead skeletons out there as trellises to grow up. And, and the, they, they mature out and the grasses mature out. And, and, and then you have that they die of their own volition. They aren't killed when they're green and young as much as possible. And 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 then there's their carbon bodies are are durable and they've lived their whole lives and they die of contentment. And you not only have long lasting organic material to feed your soil micro population, but you allow the plants to root deeply into the soil and break up subsurface compaction and and cycle minerals that are deep in the soil profile back up to the top and and um, they're all pumping sugar into the soil, stimulating and feeding that soil digestive process. Very, very important. I know that some farmers and some people that are gardeners are afraid that if they let those plants, often called weeds, grow, that they'll take over. Yeah, that's a that's a common, um, a, a very that's our history. All for people and nothing for nature. And and uh, yes, that's a very very common process. And. Weeds are actually um, really important companions. They need to be managed rather than eradicated. And yet we have a lot of fears, and, 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 and justifiably so. When you work closely with nature, then and it's a delicate balance. If you just go out there and dominate, you know, you just kill everything. You approach nature with an adversarial relationship, and, and then you end up with killed soil. And, and declining soil and, and increased um, um, exogenous from outside the farm inputs like fertilizers, like we use the two pounds of nitrogen where typical uh, um, vegetable growers or for, um, corn growers what use uh, hundreds of pounds of nitrogen, tremendous cost. And, and excess nitrogen is like a street drug to plants and they'll suck it all up that they can get. And s subsequently it, toxifies them it makes them internally poisonous and so they have to suck up a lot of water to dilute it and so you have a big soft water body plant and that if you want to get bugs overfeed nitrogen that's why um, we don't have any bugs because we barely use any nitrogen two pounds per acre per year on an average and it is never applied directly to the cropping system it always goes through the compost tea brewer system and it's turned into soil biology for re-inoculation purposes and the plants get their nitrogen from the, the die off as the reproductive die off of that soil biology the bacteria goes out pisses on the rock and it, with its inoculated organic um, acids its waste and and that acid mild organic acids are exchanged for the alkalis and the calcium and all the other important elements are absorbed from the rock and into the bio, into the protoplasm of the bacteria. And then when the bacteria get old, um, they, they are drawn to the root of the plant and their cell wall is ruptured and the plant sucks up all of that good organically bonded mineral compound that's their protoplasm first. Is it harder to practice natural process agriculture or do you think it's because it sounds very complex, how did you get to the point where you knew what to do with the plant? By paying attention. There is, you, you look at the, it, it, first off, it is, you, you could say it's harder, but it's, it, in the long run, um, it's something, and it requires, it, it's not necessarily adaptive 
so well to massive scale. It's an intimate kind of thing. When the weeds are growing with those zucchinis, they need to be mowed at the right time. And whether the zucchinis or the potatoes, but when you are, are growing, is it complex and is it worth it to actually grow the soils of our, our sustenance of our planet rather than mine the soils like conventional agriculture is mining the soil and reducing. We lose more topsoil off of the corn growing fields of the Midwest than we get in, in tonnage yields of actual corn every year. And, and soon your soil will be, will be dead and gone. And it requires increasing inputs under those circumstances in a natural process with, with very um, limited um, influences and um, it, uh, outside inputs. We use raw crushed rock, which is rock that's crushed to a fine powder um, to make sure we have all the minerals. We use calcium-bearing rock and sulfur-bearing rock, all naturally mined organic substances. And then we inoculate with indigenous biology. And subsequently, we uh, that, that's pretty much all of our inputs. You know, we don't need bug killers and we don't need fertilizers. And bug killers and fertilizers are what are huge inputs on about 30% of our production costs in conventional agriculture. We don't have those things. And at the same time, we're growing the soil. And it's, it's uh, what do you want? At the end of your life, do you want a vibrant farm to pass on to the next generation? Or do you want an eroded, desecrated farm that the next generation is hard scrabble and uh, can't grow very much and requires lots of capital inputs in order to produce anything? You know, it's, what, what, what's, what's your long-term cost? Do you want to take up um, a heroin habit, and uh, or, or or do you want to take up a, a, a habit of eating um, clean, healthy foods? So I've heard you speak about some of the rules, and this is kind of getting a little bit more specific about what you've been speaking about. But you talking about the so-called rules of natural process agriculture, and one thing that really struck me, and you did mention this earlier, but you for cover cropping, you do not wipe out the you don't kill the plants right before they blossom can you tell us just a bit it it was different than any other um, methods of cover cropping i've heard yes well that's known as um, at first bloom killing them at first bloom is is in is basically infanticide um that that's like uh, 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 losing your daughters at, at first blood, um, where, where allowing the plant to come to full maturity is like losing grandma at, at ninety some years old, or whatever. And and grandma dies of of and and it's sad, of course, but uh, to lose any, but it's really sad to lose a daughter, and and it's expected in a certain degree of contentment to to lose old age grandma and um, the same thing with the soil you we have this green manure business and and that dumps a lot of nitrogen quickly into the soil the plants haven't had their opportunity to grow and express their whole life and and they're they um, are a nitrogenous water body plant in in their youth like that and and so they rock down very quickly and release a flush of nitrogen which under many conditions turns to ammonia gas and sterilizes the soil and then evaporates, volatilizes back into the atmosphere. And so there's really very little improvement. And you certainly can't build soil organic matter with uh, with green manure cover cropping, whereas if you allow the plant to come to maturity, you get all of those benefits of deep rooting, mineral cycling, and steady state carbonaceous material. And the green manure um, rots down and has a half-life of five or seven weeks. And, and the mature cover cropping system where the plants died of its own volition has a half-life of greater than one year. So it doesn't all rot in one year. And you not only have a steady state carbon, hydrogen, carbon bond food supply for, for the soil microorganism food all the time, but you actually carry some through to the next year and you grow your soil organic matter content. You grow the soil while you grow people with mature cover cropping systems. And it, certainly is, is um, 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 in some ways, more difficult to be intimate and grow um, soil while you grow um, human side food. But at the same time, it's back to that point. What do you want to leave as your legacy? Healthy soils or a desert? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then as far as um, feeding the soil, you mentioned, you've mentioned that plants are carnivorous. And so talking about soil and plant digestion. And so is the remineralization part of that um, plant and soil digestion? Yeah, very important. We typically um, uh, have deficient mineral deficiencies and mineral deficiencies are, are the core of 
of, of all, uh, most all you know, disease disorders, not only in the soil, but in our flesh. Our, our plants don't have minerals, and so then they can't build. All plants have complete immunological systems, but they need the nutritional support, which all of the catalysts in the enzymatic chains are, are all minerals, mineral compounds of one form or another. And and if you don't have those, then the plant can't form and function completely. And and so you want to give the plant a life of choice. That's why we use quickly cooled volcanic igneous rocks and crush them to a very fine powder of 300 um, holes in a square inch, 300 mesh. And so there's great availability and the um, fl- microfloral population of the soil um, digests that rock and transfers it into from them to the plant. And the plant has a has has this life of choice and it gets to build and form and function as it individually is required. And then it doesn't have any disease organisms and it has it, its full nutritional package itself. And so when you eat, when you eat it, you get that full nutritional package and you transfer health from the soil to the plant and to your flesh. And and if you do that enough, then to your souls as well. You've got you've got this this um, physical tra- physical completeness and the tranquility that can arise from the freedom of internalized hungers. And giving a plant a life of choice, is that making it accessible to the plant all it needs to thrive? Yeah, it's got everything in the whole world. In that, in that rock-crushed rock is, is um, about 80 different, um, for all of the 80 different um, land-based uh, earth elements, and they're held in thousands of different mineral combinations, especially if the rock is very quickly cooled like volcanic ash and cinder, and then we call it as a paramagnetic rock. And and so it's all there, and its electron surface area is all available for organic bonding uh, to become catalysts in the living in the living systems. And and so it has it has it achieves its physical completeness in association with its digestive um, assistance in the soil. That microfloral population is absolutely essential, as well as having all everything there that the plant can can form and function with. Like we we say we have um, you know, we know what are macro and micro nutrients and essential things. Well, plants absorb all sorts of different things that humanity doesn't recognize as essential, or actually maybe in many cases toxic. Like the carrot absorbs and um, of gold in its foliage. And uh, science dismisses it as osmotic, um, mass osmotic pollution, but uh, carrots do accumulate gold in their foliage, where other plants, like the walnut tree, accumulates mercury in its wood. And and if you try to grow a walnut tree in a mercury-free um, uh, you know, medium, then its wood is not black, but it's white, and it doesn't grow very well. And no, it's, we don't. It's arrogant of us to think that we know across the board what what uh, plants need. It's absolutely wonderful that we have scientific minds that have achieved the base of knowledge that we have, and I certainly encourage all scientific exploration. However, to transfer a limited um, mental um, observation knowledge that we call science into the foundation of the soil and the life of a plant health, we hardly individually know what we really individually need to keep us happy and healthy um, how are we supposed to know what what a plant an organism of a different order of life really really requires and then we test one one um, cardoon plant let's say and and then oh, we say that they're all the same they all need the same thing well that doesn't hold true usually in in um, living populations there's variance between each um, individual as to its accumulatory its nutritional foundation base and but you, um, you and I have uh, differences in our consumptive habits. So interesting. And so a plant that has this life of choice and has the available nutrients that we think that it needs, does that plant nutritionally, I would assume that it, it can create um, the essential oils and the phytochemicals that make it vibrant and alive. And then that would affect our health and the other grazers and eaters that consume that plant. You've got it. That's what it's all about. Health transferring from the soil to your flesh um, and through the plants uh, or, or the m- milk that the cow makes, all of it, straight, straight across. No, very, very important. Our food today is hollow. 
and and uh, w- w- we have a lot of internalized hungers. We have, as a human organism, we have great, great potential, but we live and develop an adversarial relationship with the structure of nature, and, and we fight the nature, to, and then we get that antagonistic energy and the limits of nutritional completeness in our food, and then we feed our children with food that's been grown with adversity rather than with the loving embrace of nurturing. And um, and subsequently, isn't it a wonder that we have so much adversity and instability in, in our lives, minds? Physical completeness is you know, from the soil up. That's the foundation of, of, of what we really should be striving for here on planet Earth. Local, indigenous varieties, old-fashioned, stint, tried and true, open-pollinated rather than genetically manipulated varieties, natural process or organic, whatever you want to call it, cultural systems that grow soil while we grow people. There's, there's plenty of opportunity taking systems of, of measuring carbon and making money so a few people get uh, very wealthy and transferring carbon credits around, taking and utilizing that our, our intelligence and capacities to turn those deserts that we, humanity has made in its history back into, into meadows and forests. Very easily done. The desert is a desert because it's lost its its carbon structure, its soil biology has starved out and collapsed. The plants have all died, and then the wind comes and carries all of the good soft remaining minerals in the soil surface crushed out, leaving the silicaceous hard heavy elements behind. Now instead of um, instead of beating the bush around to make money off of us. Uh, off of what we call climate change or whatever, um, then if we're really sincere as an organism about taking care of our planet, then we go out and we do just that. We remineralize those deserts and re-inoculate those deserts and reintroduce, spread the indigenous life support plants across those areas. And we employ we employ the underemployed in order to do that work. We do get two jobs done with one expense. We fix the despoiled land and we give opportunity of, of employment and of human expression to un- under unemployed individuals mm-hmm. worldwide mm-hmm. boots on the ground but in a different way I think well probably more likely uh, bare feet on the yeah. ground yes yes and do you foresee bob you have been doing this for a long time and do you foresee us reaching a point where we gain common sense and begin this work I'm afraid probably not in my lifetime, but if we keep flummoxing these ideas out and around, keep spreading the conceptualizations of why at some time in the future, if humanity is going to survive as, as a healthy organism, then we need to care for our foundation and improve our foundation. Yes, um, humanity can certainly despoil things. We've recognized that. Well, we certainly have the capacity to, to heal our mistakes and actually make life life better here in california right now we have a a problem with lack of water uh, and drought well you know our pastures and hillsides used to be filled when white man first came here with perennial grasses that were green until until july and august and the the confinement grazing wiped them out and the trees of our hillsides were all chopped down and in order to open the west for grazing and harvest of wood and everything else and and uh, forest work and soil work. Uh, there's we have loads of people that are living in in the urban infrastructure that are are n- not really well suited for that high density. And so we have homelessness and all sorts of of excessive uh, mind altering substance consumption and and all sorts of disorders where so many of us are are not adapted to the urban structure. We do extremely well caring for the structure of nature. We have. Um, we have the wilderness areas that have pretty much, many, many of them have all ready. They aren't true wilderness. They, you know, like in a few, five years, four years ago, there were three, 400,000 acres of pine forest in, in eastern Texas, Oklahoma that burnt off. And, and it was all secondary tertiary regrowth forest. And you cut down a forest and it throws it into terrible internalized confusion in there. You harvested it, but your job's not done. You have to go there and, and thin out the regrowth and cultivate that forest so that it returns to a, a bounty for the next generation and is healthy in the meantime. 
We right here in California, our dear Governor Jerry Brown has just claimed that we need a emergency because we have 20 million trees dying off from bark beetle. And much of that problem is because of overgrowth and poor quality, uh, intense, intense internal competition within the forest structure. You know, people need the forest and forest needs people. The farm soils need people. We need to have highly diversified local food production so that we can be intimate with the structure of nature and at the same time bring um, locally grown intimate healthy foods to the to the human population. And instead of supporting the uh, um, corporate um, GMO monolithic entities, we grow our own food and, and we can starve those um, those entities into a uh, into a more realistic consciousness, rather than domin- attempting to dominate nature, you work with and nurture nature, and at the same time, you and your children will be nurtured. And so, really, wilderness and nature they needs us to work with her or with it. Especially once that we've we've despoiled it, you know, we go in and harvest off all of the the money trees and like we have a beautiful spread ranch one of our ranches up in red bluff california north of here and and it's up in the hills and it used to be a sugar pine forest and it was all harvested and it all grows back with heavy underbrush and thickets and the small pine trees the regrowth pine trees and about every 50 years all that land just burns off because it's congested and it gets worse and worse at every cycle whereas if you go through there and you have harvested your your trees. First off, let's not let's get rid of clear cutting, but you can you appropriately harvest and and then you actually can grow a better forest and you can you, know, you can go out into a despoiled piece of ground like this one I'm sitting on that when I first came here didn't grow anything but star thistle and morning glories and foxtails. Uh, you can improve that soil and and that's very beneficial not only for the for the earth and for the next generations but me personally, it's very beneficial for my soul to have actually done something, uh, what I perceive as very positive. I grow about uh, 500 um, vegetable meals, very healthy vegetable meals a day off of this garden. And at the same time, this soil is, is ready to go to the next generation and continue that kind of production without the struggle of, of integration that I inherited from the 40-year-old turkey operation. And that brought me brings me to a question I had, and I, you may have just answered it, but how has working with nature and plants affected your life? Oh, my God, that's I wouldn't be speaking with you here. I would not have developed. If I didn't have curiosity about nature, I never would have developed a thesis of natural interactive process, and, and I wouldn't be the person I am. I wouldn't have the mind that I have. I wouldn't have the strength and the health that I have. Um, I wouldn't have the students that I have. I wouldn't have... A foundation of not great but balanced uh, a tr- tranquil economic stability um, I wouldn't I, I'd be a, you know if I had to live in the urban structure for these last um, I'm 52 years old for these last 40 years let's say you know I probably either be dead incarcerated or in the insane asylum no I'm I'm, I've, I'm very delicate as most of us are very delicate in some form or another some of us can live within the social direction that, that we seem to be moving in. Some of us have great minds and are scientists. Some of us are simpletons and, and work and can see the structure of nature that the scientists can't even see. So we have a wide range of potential potential brilliances and geniuses, and, and everybody needs to be able to find a place, that place in themselves. And Many, many of us are can find that within within the embrace of, of the natural world rather than that of the you know, institutional world. And you have you um, have an institute where people can come and learn how to practice and do your natural process agriculture. Can you tell us about the Green String Institute? Yeah, GreenStringInstitute.org is. Um, is a 90-day program. I've been doing it for, I believe, eight years now. It's 90 days, and, and so I have four 90-day programs a year and about 120 lecture topics that I attempt to cover every semester. And I, my goal is to expose the student population to a wide range of not only the foundation issues associated with growing plants, but of skills that 
that allow one to have the confidence to leave the program of graduation and go become a local food producer in their community. I have students from all over the, the nation, basically every state over the years. I have uh, 12 to 15 students in each group, and they all live there together and, and eat off the farm, and they get paid a stipend and I cover their social security and workman's comp and they get about 50 or a hundred dollars a week in in pocket money. And, and they uh, get up in the morning and they have a few small chores and then they work on the, on the farm as a team until lunchtime. And then they have an hour and a half after the hour and a half at one thirty, I come uh, usually me, but one of my associates and they receive a, a lecture on one of the many topics and, it's supposed to be two hours, but like yesterday, I wasn't done with them until 4.30. And um, we cover a wide range of different elements from uh, use of, of how to use and maintain uh, things like a shovel. Most people don't know how to use a spade or spade the soil. So we start with the small hand tools for the small hand worked garden. And we go right through the maintenance and care and use of tractors and uh, tractor implements and and we learned asexual propagation, like crafting and growing plants by cutting, because we most of us don't have any any money, so we need to grow our own fruit trees and berry trees. And we learned how to broadcast in the old-fashioned way and grow all of our own vegetable and flower transplants. And we learned how to direct sow all of the various seeds that we plant directly in the garden, like like the carrots and the turnips and the beets and uh, so on and so forth. And we, we learn how to use chainsaws and, and um, use small arms um, a lot of times. Like we'll have predaceous problems, a million problems like ground squirrels or something like rabbits, something like that. We have to protect the garden so they'll get a course in the use of, of the small caliber 22 rifle. And, and the chainsaw is very important. And we go out into the forest and we do tree surgery work and we learn a foundation of, of, of forest management but just touching on a wide range of different subjects like that, woodworking is very important. We have to learn how to fix our tools. We go to the coppice and we don't go to the hardware store and buy new handles for our shovels. We go to the coppice and we learn how to fashion from a little um, shoot from the, from the coppice, how to refashion new handles for our shovels and hoes and implements like that. Um, and uh, the students for the most part do very well. And I have a, a, a pretty good record of, of, of successful um, operators out there you can stay for it's a 90-day program but if we want and you want um, then you can sign up for the graduate program and you can stay for another 90 days and subsequently if if we need and you want uh, you might become a uh, an employee here at old home farm terry and an old student of six years now and has been running this 25-acre home farm here by herself, growing all of the products. About 500 vegetable meals a day. She just drove off with a a three-quarter ton pickup loaded to the gills with broccoli and onions and leeks and, gee, I didn't, a a rhubarb I saw. I don't know what she picked, a whole whole load of stuff off to our store, which is associate Green String Farm is associated with Green String Institute, another farm property. You're growing so much biodiversity there. Mm Mm-hmm. That's what you have to do. Always more by sharing. Greed won't get you very far. You can be greedy and try to and kill all of the weeds and push all of the competition out of your farm, garden, land, and you'll end up with dead soil and become a greater and greater struggle. And so if someone's listening right now and they're a gardener or a farmer and they are having moderate success with their farm, they're not really working so much with nature, but they're gardening, what is the best advice that you could give them to get started with more natural process agriculture? Well, first off, use old-fashioned, common, open-pollinated genetics. Don't get suckered in for all of these narrow-band hybrids that they sell if there's a catalog, a seed catalog that has pretty color pictures in it, you probably want to set that one aside and get one like um, Fedco Garden Seeds. The Fedco is a co-op. They do sell some hybrids, but they are very reasonably priced, old-fashioned, open-pollinated plants. And those old-fashioned, open-pollinated strains have genetic diversity in them, so they don't all ripen all at once that the local small producer doesn't need. They ripen over a longer period of time. Commercial hybrid cauliflower is designed to be picked 
off all at the same time with big machines where if you plant off the thousand cauliflower plants in your local gardener, you can't sell a thousand of them all at once. But the open pollinated ones, you won't need to because they ripen out over the course of a of a period of time. Um, maybe it depends on your location and varieties and everything, but a month or two. And so you'll have a steady state food supply of cauliflower. And you look at peppers, and peppers are con- con- contemporary pepper varieties are have been selected to grow under high nitrogen conditions, and and they don't hardly have any flavor, and they are weak rooted plants, and they need that high nitrogen in order to grow well. But where old fashioned pepper plants are really tough and hardy, and uh, the open pollinated carrots, you get the narrow band ones, and you do something a little bit wrong, and they'll all die. And the open pollinated seeds are about 10 percent of the cost of the average hybridized seed, and so you want to spend your money on on environmental support rather than fancy genetics as a as a, a small producer and, and and then you spend all the rest of your money on environmental support. Most soils are deficient in calcium and sulfur. They're both very important and they're both very water soluble and they're easily cropped out. And most gardens that I visit in circumstances you have bug and insect problems. First first and foremost calcium and sulfur and so you get calcium and sulfur, natural calcium and sulfur bearing rock forms. And and then if you are up to it, then you get very fi- fine crushed volcanic rock, and that brings all the other elements to the garden. And then you need to inoculate your garden, and you go up into the into the nature, the best cleanest nature that you can find, and you scrabble around, and you look underneath the different kinds of trees and ferns and mosses and everything, and you take a few teaspoons or tablespoons, a cup maybe, it's plenty of of soil from those areas, and you bring that back, and you you can stir it into non-chlorinated water on a small scale and uh, then strain it off and put it in your watering can or sprayer or whatever and sprinkle that on your garden soil and, uh, and water it in. Don't do it in the sunlight. Or it will kill the UV. It will kill them. But, but do it at, in the evening after the sun's gone down or very early in the morning and water it in. And you will inoculate your soil with your indigenous microfloral population. Very important. And 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 um, then you learn how to observe your plants. You look at the old plant parts, the old the cotyledon is first seed leaf. And if there's any stress in the plant, then it, it, it's not going to have good posture and color and, and it's not going to grow well. And you compare that old leaf with the new leaves and you use bugs as indicators of plant health. And if you're on a small scale, you know, you're a family food grower and you have a a quarter acre urban suburban lot, why well, you probably can't really afford to grow too many nature support crops. So you'll base your your soil organic matter on on composts, which are waste stream materials that have been harvested from some other acre and thoroughly nicely digested and brought to your soil to support the the carbon requirements of of the digested system in the soil and. But if you're on a bigger scale, then you, you can certainly grow interplanted. You don't have to uh, go hog wild like me and grow all weeds. You can you can plant um, things like buckwheat and clover between those uh, zucchini plants if you don't like amaranthus and and get the same benefits of a diverse most of the same benefits of a diversified system. If you are a Midwest corn grower and you could get the GMO corn, the Roundup Ready corn, and go back to cultivated corn and Typically, you'll cultivate the corn two or three times, and on your final cultivation, you can take and mount the front, um, a front of the tractor mounted uh, um, seed broadcaster, and you could broadcast something like vetch over the soil, and your cultivation implements will cultivate the vetch seeds into the soil while the corn is about a oh, foot or 18 inches tall, and your final cultivation and the vetch will sprout and grow up underneath the corn, and then once the corn is harvested. And oftentimes in the fall, in many environments, there's still more growing time. At first, the vetch is down there in the shade and won't get very big. But as soon as the corn is harvested and the the stalks are chopped, uh, then the sunlight and organic material, then the vetch will take off and it will grow until it freezes and gets snowed under in Ohio or someplace like that. And and then in the springtime, the snow will melt out and and the soil will be too wet to cultivate and prep for continuous corn again, so the vetch will have another cycle of opportunity for growing, and, and you can significantly reduce your applied commercial nitrogen by, by sharing like that, even on a, a big commercial-like scale at very um, low cost, a few dollars per acre to, 
to mount a and plant a vet seeds or some other form of, of of leguminous plant on the on the front of the tractor while you're already driving it across there and and uh, get two jobs done with one work. That's the motion towards success. So there's there's many many answers because there are so many different uh, scales and and variabilities and so many ways to the garden on a small scale people get sucked into all of this machinery stuff you have a less a little lot a quarter acre lot and like a half or a quarter a sixteenth of an acre garden use use the benefits of of exercise don't go to the gym but stay and work the garden it'll bring tranquility and strength to your mind and flesh i love this you you i i i want to go to your school <laughs> is everyone that goes to your school like 20 years old <laughs> No, no, they no. aren't. My <laughs> oldest, my oldest student, um, the Scotsman, and he's still around. Um, I gave him a little garden strip, about a quarter of an acre, I guess it is, out on my green string farm. Um, he was uh, 67 when he came, and I, because of the ridiculous child labor rules, I can't um, hire anybody until they're 18. But any anything between 18 and uh, physically able age, no limit on oldness at all. Oh, that's great. Oh, good. <laughs> well, this has been so fabulous. And I had, do you have time for one more question? Sure. Okay. Um, you spoke a lot about observing the plants and that the plants um, will tell you what they need. Can you just tell us just a bit about that? How does someone hone their skill in that? Well, first off, by paying attention. And now let's start here with go to the nursery and buy a plant. Well, don't plan on doing that. You have to learn how to grow your own plants because nursery plants are forced dead and they're sick and weak suckers and they probably won't be very satisfactory for you. But you know, I'm talking about annual plants like a tomato or a pepper or something like that. So go get one of those plants, you know, and I'm sure many of your listeners have. And you pull it out of the pot and where do you find the roots? All wrapped around down on the bottom outside edge of the pot. They're trying to get out. Plants have two kinds of roots. They have seeking establishment and seeking roots. And those are means that they're not happy where they are and they have to go a long way to get to what they need, need to get to in order to achieve their um, life of reproductivity and, and health. And so the seeking root is in first indication. If you pull a plant out of its little pot and its pot is filled with fibrous roots, then that's an indication of contentment. It's happy where it is. It doesn't need to seek for the size that it is in its pot. And those that's your first thing. And now um, go out into your garden and try to pull a weed. And that weed, if it's a dock or a malva, something like that, it's impossible to pull. Anchorage, pull your tug on the root of your broccoli plant and, and see how well it's anchored. A plant that's happy where it's at has great anchorage. One that's unhappy will just slip right out. Look at the oldest leaf, like the cotyledon, and observe its size and its color and its posture and its texture. And now compare that with, with the next leaf and the bigger leaf. You, if you get a, the plant is naked and it's not going to run away and it hasn't learned any kind of deception, taste it and smell it. It doesn't have, wear perfume. It doesn't wear dark glasses. It's right there. Use your, all of your common senses and observe the radiality of the whole plant and the bilateral symmetry of the, of the leaf parts of most uh, dicots. Um, pick off a leaf and tear it. Put your four fingers together and hold it. Hold a little piece of leaf between your thumb and forefinger and bend your fingers up and put tension on the leaf and test the tear strength. Look at the difference between the old and, and the contemporary. And you can, if you learn the history of the plant by paying attention, you'll see how many leaf scars it's had, how straight and smooth and fat or, or corroded and lesioned is its stem. And you get the, its past and you look at its present and then you can predict its future. If it had a miserable past and it looks pretty good right now because you've loved it up and nurtured it, why then it'll have a moderate future. If it has a difficult past and, and it's all stunted and bug-eaten and everything else and it's the same in its present leaves, its big leaves, why then you can predict that it's going to have a miserable future. And so this now means it's a sick plant and it gives it you a great opportunity to utilize your resources. Go get some compost or get some inoculum compost, get some uh, calcium and sulfur-bearing rocks and broad-spectrum raw um, um, volcanic rocks and feed the plant. Put some little bit of compost right at the base. Feed the baby. Put a tablespoon or two, just a little bit, right around the plant. 
water it in. Come back in a couple of days and take your pen knife out and dig the soil away from from the base, not pulling the plant, but just looking down in and seeing if you find new white roots growing upwards into that leachate base of whatever you applied. And observe if you see those little new white roots shooting upwards into into the leachate, well, then you know that the plant's telling you that, that what you did is what it would like more of. And use the concept of many light meals. We have Thanksgiving coming up and people have a tendency sometimes to eat too much and we know what that's like perhaps. Uh, You want the same thing with the plant. You want to give the plant many light meals and feed the plant directly rather than broadcasting your rock powders over the soil and spading them all in. Give those right to the baby. You know, bring in a plate of peas to the child uh, in in your high chair. uh, You put the plate right before the child and 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 then the child spreads the peas around all over the floor and maybe eats a few, hopefully. But, uh, you know, why should the mom even bother with putting them on the plate? You know, just come and throw them on the floor. The child will still eat just as many, but have to spend a lot of energy crawling around trying to find them. It might be fun, too, but, yeah. um, you know. <laughs> it's so so uh, things like that. And, you know, what what can I say in a, in a half-an-hour conversation like this? And is there anything um, that I didn't ask you that you would like to share with listeners today? Oh, gee. Um, um, uh, study, you know, expose yourself to, to literature. There's, there, when I started this business, the only literature out there were a few writings by old Sir Howard out of England on organic and, and a Rodale uh, Robert Rodale work, uh, Organic Gardening Magazine, which was um, very limited. Uh, but today we have we have a good publishing house in the form of Acres USA, and and they have a regular magazine, a really good publishing house, all on the foundations of how to take care of soil and grow soil and grow healthy animals and and become a a real natural um, part a, a, a part a real supportive part of of nature. Mm while growing food for people. It's great. Well, thank you so much, Bob, for spending this out. It actually was an hour. Thank you so much for spending this time with me today. It was fabulous. My pleasure. It's part of my job. We've got to get all out there and start feeding our local communities. The local clean food producer, the carer for the land, is just as an important uh, uh, contributor as the doctor or the lawyer. And it really is the doctor on some level, right? Because the food becomes us ourselves. That's right. If if we grew and ate good, clean food, like um, we would need the doctor much less, and maybe our minds would become less adversarial, and we'd need the lawyer less. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. My pleasure, and thank you for your work. Great. Bye bye. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening.